All right, let me get things back going. For people online or who have just joined us, um, I want to let you all know that I am working to get the recordings up on Moodle. I have the afternoon off today, no patient care, woo. Um, so I will be doing that this afternoon. I just have to upload it to YouTube and then post it on our Moodle page because they're too big of files. So it will take me some time, but they will all get up there today for you if you want to rewatch sessions. Thank you for keeping me honest. Okay, all right. Just make sure my mute's off, my video's on, and we are recording and screen sharing. Great. All right. So now we're going to move into, we got through proteins. Now we're going to move into the wonderful world of carbohydrate digestion. So not just alpha amylase, but what else happens? So with our carbohydrate breakdown, we talked about alpha amylase uh, occurring in the saliva, but then it reoccurs again in our small intestines. And so in our small intestines, carbs and starch must be broken down into at least disaccharides, then monosaccharides, our, our glucose, fructose, and galactose, our three common monosaccharides. That's what we're able to absorb and then therefore use in the body. So alpha amylase can cleave the alpha 1-4 bonds of starch, but can't cleave one alpha 1-6 one bond. So alpha amylase can get you to a di or trisaccharide. From there, you have to digest the rest. So maltose and maltotriose um, and limit dextrin are not digestible by alpha amylase at all due to those alpha 1-6 bonds. So there's, there has to be more than alpha amylase. So alpha glucosidase digests the rest of our starch or our dye or trisaccharides, except for dextrin. Dextrin is broken down with alpha dextrinase. Uh, both are located on the surfaces of intestinal cells. So if you if you want to take away one thing from this, alpha amylase is going to cleave most of your carbohydrates into dye or trisaccharides, and then from there, two enzymes on the surface of the intestinal cells, alpha glucosidase and dextrinase, are going to digest the rest. Right. And again, if you're like, what are you talking about here with, so this is starch, alpha amylase. So then you can see this is what limit dextrin looks like or maltotriose. This would be a trisaccharide. Limit dextrin, it's this bond here that amylase can't digest, can't break down. So that's why we have to have alpha glucosidase or alpha dextrinase to be able to break that specific one six bond. Digest, disaccharides are easier to digest than complex carbs. Well, that seems like an obvious, right? Complex carbs are gonna be more complex, more harder to digest. So we have specific enzymes that can actually digest our di disaccharides down and make them in our mon into our monosaccharides and they look like their name, okay? Which is helpful. So sucrose broken down by sucrase, lactose by lactase, okay? So when in doubt, that's, that's fabulous. We like things that have the same name. Um, sucrose is, yes. Highly unlikely on this test, but has happened at least once, but I would say low yield. So don't commit it to memory, unless if it's already there. Be better for you to know sucrose and sucrase, lactose, lactase, those type of things. It'd be more like lactase breaks down, uh, or what is your enzyme that can break down milk carbohydrates in the body? Uh, that might be a question. Or if a patient's having trouble, if a patient's having um, lactose intolerance, what is the enzyme that's likely affected? And then it would be lactase. They'd probably list lactose. They might list amylase. And they might list like pepsin, something totally wrong. Um, and so then it's understanding it's lactase. That's where I would see these used is like they would give you some type of pathology. Um, they would say that there's some type of issue with digestion or absorption. And they would ask you what enzyme may be affected or um, what macromolecule might be having difficulty being absorbed. It could be a reverse, um, but either, either or. Again, sucrase and lactase, like our alpha glucosidase, are all on the surfaces of those intestinal cells. These are all hanging out on the small intestine on that surface, waiting to contact those different molecules, which is why, again, the more surface area we have available, the more absorption, digestion, and assimilation we're going to have. You need to know that there's specific loot transporters that transport certain, certain structures in. I would say the two that would probably be the most important that will come up is 
GLUT5 because it's fructose as transporter. So that one's just different than the others. And then GLUT2 because it's going from the cell to the blood. So if you're going to commit two to memory, it'd be these two. Otherwise, just know if you see a GLUT transporter, it's going to be dealing with carbohydrate and starch absorption and transport. I have not seen any GLUT questions on an NPLEX exam. I have seen them on a bronze exam, but I've never seen them on an NPLEX exam. <laughs> <laughs> but if they were going to ask you one, they like what is not like the other. So fructose, glute five, and then glute two from the cells to the blood. And so again, once you are absorbing things through from the lumen, so lumen of the intestinal cell is over here. This is your intestinal cell, and this would be your blood on this side. Um, so glucose and galactose are going to be transported with sodium, this SGLT symporter. That's so that gets you glucose and galactose, and then fructose, like I mentioned, has its own special transporter, GLUT5. All three of them go through GLUT2 to the blood. And then from the blood, they go to wherever they need to go, right? Then they're in systemic circulation. All right, lipids are just complicated. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so maltose itself from starch and maltotriose and limit dextrin all from different starchy molecules. So more complex carb breakdown. Yeah. Versus fructose from your veggies and then lactose from milk. Gluc or maltose is just glucose plus glucose if we remember together. Typically, like sweet potatoes, cereals, things like that have a decent amount of maltose in them. Big questions. I love it. I love me some carbohydrate discussion in the morning. All right. As I'm having my simple carbs over here. Okay. So lipids are complicated. They just are. High energy yield. They're highly reduced. Therefore, they're hydrophobic. They have lots of energy, but it makes it so we have to do some special stuff to break them down. So lipid digestion kind of starts in the stomach. All right. And it starts in there. It's in, lipids are ingested in their triacylglycerol form. So we have our, our glycerol and then our lipid molecule, lipid molecule, lipid molecule. It looks like a scary E. Um, and they must get to free fatty acid form for us to absorb them. So we have to break them apart, break them down. We have some biochemical processes that can help us do this, right? We learned those yesterday, but we're going to talk more on a physiological level today. What are the what are the actual breakdown products that are helping us do those biochemical processes? So lipids are prepped for digestion in the stomach through that grinding process, the grinding and mixing action that makes us an emulsion. Think about salad dressing, right? You add some oil, you add some vinegar, and you see what happens. Your your vinegar is your stomach acid. Your oil is your fat. You're going to have to mix and mix it together to make that emulsion happen. Once they move to the small intestine, the emulsification is enhanced with bile salts. So this is our first mention of gallbladder and its support for breaking down lipids. That's why someone who has a cholecystectomy or cholecystitis or cholecystitis or any gallbladder condition, fat digestion is going to be affected in some way, shape, or form, especially if there's an issue with secretion of bile. Now, again, gallbladder does not create bile super common thing that they like to test us on because they'll, it'll confuse you. You'll doubt yourself on the NPLEX, even though you know that bile is created in the liver and it's stored in the gallbladder and secreted into the small intestine. So don't let them get you. They will ask something like that or try to. So anyways, once we once lipids are in the small intestine, bile salts, they're amphipatic molecules. They come from cholesterol. So it's a way that we can actually get rid of excess cholesterol is creating bile salts. And they're made in the liver, secreted in their gallbladder in response to that cholecystic kinin, CCK. Bile salts bind to lipid droplets and make them more soluble. So that's their main goal is to actually help the lipids become more soluble by binding to those bile salts. From there, in the small intestine, we use lipases, which are pancreatic enzymes, to break down our triacylglycerol to our free fatty acids and monoacylglycerol. So three free fatty acids typically, and then like one glycerol backbone. The final products are those 
as such, and they're carried into my cells, right? The little cells, I have a picture in a slide. My cells that can kind of help that hydrophobic molecule be able to exist in the water created lumen. They're globular, they form by small lipids and the polar heads are all outward facing, just like a, a mini cell membrane, right? So outward facing is the polar heads, inward facing is all the fatty stuff. And then bile salts themselves, the release of bile salts stimulate our body to make my cells. So again, if the gallbladder has some type of pathology or some type of issue with us secreting or creating bile acids or bile salts, all of our lipid absorption, even transport is gonna be affected. So that's why you can see things like scatteria, right? Fats staying in your intestinal lumen and then being excreted via stool. So here's our picture. So we have our lumen of our intestine over here. We have our intestinal cell here and we have our blood over here, right? So we have our triacylglycerol, we add in some water, we have our lipases, we get free fatty acids and monoacylglycerol. They are then transported into intestinal cells by fatty acid binding protein. That's all that stands for. It's literally saying what it is. It's a fatty acid binding protein, transports it into the intestinal cell from the cell membrane. From there, they're moved into the smooth endoplasmic reticulum because that's where they can be packaged, right? That's where we package things in, the, in our cells. It's the small endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi body. So they're moved into smooth ER via fatty transport proteins. That's what FATP is. It's just fatty acid transport protein. I love when acronyms literally mean what they're saying, right? Makes it easier. Then our triacylglycerols are resynthesized from fatty acids and monoacylglycerol. So we're able to act, we actually remake our triacylglycerols once we're inside the cell in our endoplasmic reticulum. The resynthesized lipids are associated with some type of protein potentially, a small amount of phospholipid and cholesterol and are formed here in that smooth endoplasmic reticulum within our cells. So phospholipid formation, cholesterol formation, protein formation. We also form our chylomicrons there and they'll transport our newly formed lipid products into our bloodstream and lymph system. Now, is there transport and is there some flow of free fatty acids directly through the bloodstream? Absolutely. There are some free fatty acids that are able to go into bloodstream and float around, but much smaller. And why do we think that's the case? Is blood hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Like, right? It's a, it's a watery substance, not typically, ideally a fatty substance. So typically for having things pass through blood or lymph, they need to be packaged in a way that they can transport freely because fats don't play well with water. Okay. So typically transports occurred in some type of micelle, some type of transport me mechanism or vesicle, but you can see some free fatty acids floating through your blood. You can actually measure fats, right? We can measure cholesterol, we can measure LDL, we couldn't do any of those things if there wasn't some fat in our blood. That's digestion. You know it all. Questions, comments, concerns? Yes, good. I love, I love random. Patty. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's a great point. You know, so you're going to have chylomicrons transported into blood and into lymph cells, but lymph transports through the body a little faster than our full circulation of blood does. And lymph drains through the heart, typically first, heart and lymph nodes, and axillary area. So it is why it's so sensitive because all of the blood's passing through the heart, through our circulatory system, and our lymph is draining through there first. So it gets like a double hit, a double whammy versus some of our other tissues maybe aren't directly as affected. Yeah, that's a great point. Awesome. Typically when I see digestion questions, digestion absorption questions on this test, it's in um, conjunction with connecting obviously some type of pathology and then also connecting some biochemical stuff. Um, so expect if you're gonna see these type of questions, that's kind of how they could be packaged together. Uh, anatomically with the gut, I have a couple papers that we'll, we'll like some practice pages we'll do later. They do like doing um, like vasculature of the gut, 
So we will go through a few like vasculature anatomy uh, pages today that will work on labeling just for some practice. Uh, otherwise, like organ wise, you should just know your four quadrants or your nine quadrants and know what organs are contained in each. Those are easy questions that you should all be able to get right. And they'll, they will ask you some of those questions like patients having um, effects in their upper, right upper quadrant, what are, right, upper quadrant, what are organs that can be affected there? Or what, um, what type of pathology may you suspect? And then they'll give you like something with the spleen, something with the gallbladder, something with an ovary, and then something completely random. And you're like, okay, right upper quadrant. Well, the only option that's here would be gallbladder. So at least make sure that you keep those things in your brain. Those will be easy grab bag questions. All right. Now that was our overview. We're gonna go a little bit more in depth now with the digestion. and regulation. Regulation is a big part of the gut, so we are going to delve in. All right, get my handy dandy slide here. And I want to save ample time for the kidney today, so we're, we're going to flow through this probably by 10-ish, maybe a little after, a little, then we'll take a little break, then we'll do a little anatomy review, and then we're going to delve into kidney. I have a decent amount of stuff that I want to get to for kitty today. We got through biochem yesterday, so I'm not going to bring that back today. We did good. We did good. All right. Regulatory substances of the GI. So this is again kind of going through six, seven, and eight in your study guide. That's what we've been looking at today. The main kind of chunks of physiology. So first we're gonna, I have this broken down by where are they sourced. So that's how I broke, broke it down first. And then we'll go in depth in all of these. But if you're a categorization person like myself, I was very much a mind map studier. I'd have all these random poster boards and papers. And it can be nice just to categorize things by where they're created or where they're secreted. That can help get you started. And then you can start trying to separate them out by cellular components or actions and things of that nature. So in the stomach, the things, the, secret, the um, regulatory substances of the gut that are secreted from your stomach is your gastrin, which is in your antrum area, your G cells in the antrum, your ghrelin, gastric acid from parietal cells, intrinsic factor also from parietal cells, pepsin from your chief cells, bicarb from mucosal cells, and somatostatin from the GI mucosa itself. So these would be a suggestion, in my opinion, would be like a good flash card, just know the regulatory component, where it's located, and if there's a specific cell associated, know that cell. So these would be strict memorization for you. Acronyms could help. Um, you could maybe try to connect it to the anatomy. If, if you're a visual person, I would say really just flashcards and commit these ones to memory. There will be questions about these specific regulatory proteins and what cells produce them. So that is something that you would need to know. Again, for anatomy of the gut. So we see here, we have esophagus with that J curve again. We see then the structure, the, the tissue itself, we start with the cardia. Let me get my little pen. Cardia. Up top, we have this fundus up here. We have our greater curve over here. We have our lesser curve on this side and our pylorus, our pyloric sphincter, our valve. And then this is duodenum. So just to kind of orient you. Muscularly, we have our cardia. We have our body. And then you can see in this muscularis externa, we have our longitudinal layer going this way, our circular layer going this way, if you think of it as like in a circle, and then our oblique layer, almost like our oblique musculature. So the stomach, it does such a good job of churning because it has these three different layers of musculature contracting all at the same time, longitudinally, circularly, and oblique. So I think of that as like a mini stomach muscle, right? We have our rectus obliques, we have our you know, our rectus femoris, we have all these different kind of contractions. We have the wraparound, we have transverse abdominis. It, it allows us to keep everything nice and tight and held in, ideally. Same thing with the stomach, right? It does the same thing just on that organ system level. It allows us to really churn and move things around effectively. You can see here the rugae of mucosa. This can be lost in conditions like atrophic gastritis, right? You lose that, some of that, you get inflammation, chronic inflammation leads to loss of our gastric rugae, leads to decreased surface area, decreased absorption then, or secretion. 
side effects could be if you're having decreased secretion, hypochlorhydria, right? Low stomach acid, low intrinsic factor, therefore low B12 absorption. So you can start making these connections without even having to know the condition, right? Thinking about it physiologically. Absolutely, because H. pylori can increase our risk for what? Ulcers, great. And ulcers do what to the tissue? Break it down. Yeah, it's going to break down the tissue. Absolutely. It's going to bring in the, it's going to ulcerate the tissue. So it's going to remove some of that rugate to cut into this tissue, make a nice smooth surface. Then afterwards, what's our body going to do? Why is it going to create a scar? Eventually, in some places, if it's not chronic and it hasn't been going on for that long, it can fully heal and you can get back some of the layers, but it is going to be decreased from where it was originally. So you'll still have some absorption, but it'll be less, less surface area. The inflammation leads to the breakdown of tissue. Absolutely. So inflammation leads to ulceration and breakdown of tissue, which leads to scar tissue formation, right? Yeah. Pro-inflammatory cytokines recruited whole nine yards. That's Monday to be continued. <laughs> so this is our base, right? Of our anatomy for stomach. All right, now we're gonna move into source of small intestine. So the small intestine players that we need to know about for regulation of the gut, gastrin, which comes from G cells, great. I love that, gastrin and G and the duodenum. And again, just a reminder, so we have our stomach here, our duodenum is gonna hit up top. Then we move into the jejunum here. And then we move into the ileum here, okay? So DJL, I'm sure someone has a good acronym for that. Then we move into the large intestine. So gastrin up top, G cells in the duodenum, other duodenal uh, regulatory components, cholecystic kinin, which we talked about, CCK, right? release and starts a lot of those digestive processes cascades from eye cells. That's in the duodenum and the jejunum. Secretin from or secretin from S cells. So that one's an easy one to remember from the duodenum. Glucose dependent insulotrophic peptide, yikes, often abbreviated as GDIP or GIP. That's from K cells in the duodenum and the jejunum. And then we also have bicarb from Brunner glands in the duodenum. I skipped these two for now just to get our duodenum ones out of the way. And bicarb is there mainly it gets released from the pancreas directly, but also from the small intestine cells to neutralize the acidity coming from the stomach, preventing breakdown of our small intestine tissue. We also then have motilin, which helps with motility, we'll look at. And vasoactive intestinal peptide or BIP which is secreted from the surface area of the mucosa. So from those small intestinal cells throughout. Again, duodenum, jejunum, ileum. So then we have some source from the pancreas. We've talked about some of these players already. So this is, should be review. Amylase for starch digestion, lipases for fats, proteases for protein, trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, and carboxypeptidases that first slide, that first box we looked at. Again, those are our proenzymes. And then trypsinogen, which becomes trypsin, which activates our proenzymes. So again, trypsinogen will come first. It'll turn into trypsin, which then activates all of our others. Sorry for the circle. <laughs> trypsinogen converts to trypsin by enterokinase, which is a brush border enzyme in the small intestine. And it's actually a positive feedback loop. So this trypsinogen conversion to trypsin continues on itself. The more trypsin that's converted, the more trypsinogen that gets converted. And it does that until there's no more processes, no more things there for it to break down and bind to. That's what shuts off that process. This is interesting because this is a positive feedback loop. We don't have many of those in the body. So when we do have one, we should remember that reaction. Right? Oxytocin was another big one that we talked about yesterday. Another positive feedback loop. And again, this picture not so great, but just to show you what we have here, we have spleen, we have our pancreas here with our tail body head. So I think of the head of the pancreas to be the closest to the small intestine because the head is looking out to see all the stuff that it's gonna need to digest. 
So that's how I keep my anatomy oriented. The tail's the furthest away from my small intestine. It's by the spleen because I don't really care, right? It's not secreting. I'm not watching for anything over there. Unless if you had like splenomegaly, but that's in the side. So you have your gallbladder up here, your right and left hepatic ducts of your liver, your cystic duct here. And then these are going to come into play and they're going to be released into our small intestine. Yes. Sorry. Retroperitoneal. Yes, um, in that the spleen is retroperitoneal, but the kidneys would be further back. So if you're looking like a slice this way, kidneys, spleen, and then tail is that direction, and then head's kind of coming out towards the interior structure. Yeah. All of that, all the pancreas is behind stomach. So that's kind of what you're what you're thinking about. I had to think about it. It's like, where is it? Let me let me think. And then there's just some random ones. I already talked a little bit about vaso. Some of these are secreted in other places too, but these are the random locations they can also be secreted from. So vaso active intestinal polypeptide, VIP, mentioned it already, but it also can be secreted directly by parasympathetic ganglia in all your sphincters and from the gallbladder. So thinking about that, we know there's going to be some type of vagal activity, right? Some type of parasympathetic input from VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, which makes sense. Vaso, I think of like vasovagal, I think of vagal, I think of parasympathetic. So that's how I remember that one. Nitric oxide, our big vasodilator. Somatostat, that's secreted all over, right? That flows through our blood. That's why it's not in one just general location. Somatostatin from D cells in our pancreatic islet. That could have been on our pancreas slide. And then bicarb, it's secreted also from pancreas, salivary glands, and mucosal cells in general. So it's also secreted kind of all over. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go deep dive into each of these. Okay. And I am spending a decent amount of time because these different regulatory enzymes, not only are they just in the gut, they can be seen in other places too. And I would, there are a decent amount of questions about them on your test. They can relate to lots of different pathologies. They can relate to physiology. They can be tied into many different things. So we are going to spend some time on it. So bicarb. All of these slides will have something to the effect of action increased by or decreased by and other factors. So if you're going to try to make flashcards or kind of commit things to memory, that's kind of how these slides are broken down. So whatever the action of this thing is in speaking specifically to the gut, but sometimes a little bit outside the gut, whatever increases it, so upregulates it, whatever downregulates it or decreases it, and then if there's any other specific factors you should know. So with bicarb, its main action is just neutralization of acid, which is helpful. It's increased by pancreas and biliary secre secretions with specifically secretin, right? So secretin, another, another component of the gut, another regulatory factor of the gut. So if pancreas and biliary secretions occur, or if secretin is present, that's going to increase bicarb. That's going to trigger bicarb to be released. Some other factors that, can, that are important here is it is in the form of the gut, it's trapped in actual mucus that covers the gastric epithelium. But what that means is it can be readily used in the, in the system of the GI, whether it's in the stomach or in the small intestine, it's trapped in the surface. So it's able to be readily used and released. And then we can see this here. You can see blood, interstitial fluid, and lumen. Okay. We have from the blood, that's how we get our bicarb, right? We're going to take CO2 and it gets mainly converted into bicarb within the body. So CO2 is coming in here. It's adding with water, using carbonic anhydrase to get bicarb as its product. And then bicarb is then being transported to the lumen in exchange for chloride. Very similar process that we already talked about before with bicarb when we talked about cellular perfusion, respiration. So our conditions where we have a lower amount of carbon dioxide in the body, right? So if we have a low amount, which we're going to get to in the kidney, we're going to talk all about acidosis and alkalosis and those fun, confusing terms. 
But anytime we have a low amount of CO2 in the body, we're gonna have a lower amount of bicarb that could affect our ability to neutralize some of these acids in the gut. So we could things, see things like hyperchlorhydria, GERD, increased risk for Barrett's esophagitis or esophagitis in general, right? Because we're having more acid that's not being neutralized. So cholecystokinin, CCK, it has a lot of different actions, which is why I kind of have this little rainbow circle picture here. But it's mean, if I do two main actions of it, it's going to increase pancreatic secretion and it's gonna decrease gastric emptying. Now it's also gonna affect the gallbladder. It's gonna encourage gallbladder contraction. So which means release of bile. It's gonna encourage the sphincter of odi relaxation, which we'll look at in one of, in our, um, one of our pictures here of our anatomy coming up. But overall, if I had to choose two things it does, I would say increase pancreatic secretion and decrease gastric emptying. Fatty acids and amino acids, so proteins and fats are gonna increase it. Because again, it's causing our gallbladder to release bile, our pancreas to release proteases. So it's gonna be released or stimulated when we need to break down fats and proteins. Other factors to keep in mind, a connection to the nervous system here, it is acting on neural muscarinic pathways. So we do our dive into the nervous system. We'll talk about muscarinic and adrenergic and all of those fun pathways again. And so cholecystokinin is one that acts on a muscarinic pathway to lead to that pancreatic secretion. So gastric acid, I know this isn't the best picture, but it looks, it looks better when it wasn't on there. So I'm sorry. So gastric acid, main action, decrease stomach pH. So again, more gastric acid, gonna make the stomach more acidic, easy. It's increased by histamine, fascinating, and vagal input via acetylcholine, as well as gastrin. So gastrin's gonna increase acidic pH. Histamine, so if we have a histamine response, we can increase uh, our uh, pH of this, or decrease the pH of the stomach, or vagal input. So thinking about our parasympathetic response. Reason behind parasympath parasympathetic response is because we want to digest our food and we digest our food better if our stomach's more acidic. That makes sense. Why histamine though? Why would histamine increase gastric acid? I will tell you one answer that is correct is that histamine just triggers release from that cell. So bind the binding of histamine just triggers a release, almost like degranulation when we have an allergic response, right? But why, why else? Why would we think if we have histamine in a large amount, let's say we had an allergic response, why would we want to make stomach acid more acidic, the stomach more acidic? Okay, maybe we're warding off some pathogens, great. Why else? This might be a precursor to our immune system. So our immune system, right? We have our TH1 or TH2 side. The things TH1 in general is gonna be fighting off infection. TH2 is gonna be helping support things like allergies and parasites. Histamine tends to be more associated with our TH2 response, our allergic or parasitic response. When the body has an influx of histamine, it's gonna actually increase our acidity of our pH partially to, to ward off a, a parasite, right? To help make it more acidic so we're less likely to have parasitic binding but also because the body thinks it has some potential food allergen or allergen that it needs to neutralize. The stomach's only defense really is churning more, re emptying one way or another faster, right? Or increasing acidity. So that's the stomach's defense against whatever's coming in is I'm going to up acidity to try to neutralize whatever's coming into it. So that's part of why histamine can increase our gastric acid. It also binds to the cell that releases gastric acid. So there is a very direct biochemical reason, but we can think physiologically. It's decreased by somatostatin, GIP, so our gastric intestinal polypeptide, prostaglandin, and secretin. So again, if you're like, if you were going to be like me, what I would suggest doing is start creating like a mind map chart, right? Have your have these different things together in their in their some one in the stomach, one in the small intestine, one in the pancreas, and show through lines and plus and minuses which ones are going to increase things and which ones are going to decrease things. 
Otherwise, you could do flashcard based if you memorize better via flashcards. But I do think a mind map would work really well here for the stomach for all these regulatory components. So then gastrin, we just talked about how gastrin can increase gastric acid, so how? So gastrin itself, its main action is to increase gastric hydrogen ion secretion. It's also going to promote growth of gastric mucosa and encourage gastric motility. So all things to help the gut be able to be more acidic, have more surface area to release more stuff to be more acidic, and then to move things through more, more um, efficiently. So motility being not only moving things from the stomach to the small intestine, but also encouraging that churning process that the stomach has. So that contractility of the stomach, the smooth muscle. It's increased by stomach distension. So it actually can check pressure receptors and stretch receptors that activate this gastrin release. Alkalinization, so when the stomach becomes too basic, it will release its gastrin. Amino acids and peptides, but amino acids more. So if it's already, actually, I think that's supposed to be a comma. So just amino acids, comma, peptides, not greater than or less than. And then also vagal stimulation via gastrin releasing peptides. So again, that vasal, vagal, vagal stimulation, our vagus nerve, our parasympathetic input. It's decreased if the pH is already low. So we already have a pH of less than 1.5. We're not going to release more gastrin. Some other factors just to keep in mind is gastrin is going to become increased with chronic PPI use. Why? Because the body is trying to overcome chronic PPI use by continuously increasing gastrin production to try to get us to be able to be acidic again. That's its only defense, right? The stomach's only way of doing stuff is churning and becoming more acidic. So if we take that away, that's why you have rebound effects after getting off of a PPI for a long period of time. Chronic atrophic gastritis is going to also increase gastrin because the body's ability to actually be able to absorb and to break things down is decreased because we have atrophy across the board. We have less ability to actually secrete all this stuff. So the body has a harder time making things acidic. So it tries to increase its gastrin production to still do its job. And then Zollinger Ellison syndrome or gastronoma, this is where we could see a really, really high elevation in gastrin itself. It doesn't necessarily mean the stomach is going to get acidic, but it means we're seeing gastrin being elevated in these conditions. So ghrelin. Ghrelin, we talked about leptin and ghrelin. So ghrelin's purpose, its main action would be to increase appetite. So Things that would increase it would be a fasting state when we're hungry, and things that would stop it would be food state, a fed state. There's also some brain components there. It's not always the most responsive or um, the most compliant hormone. We know there's other factors that can affect ghrelin release. It's going to be increased with Prader Willi syndrome and decreased after bypass surgery. So, if we are needing less food to feel full, because part of it is stretch receptors that are present in the stomach. So if it's noticing that there's a smaller amount of space, and so those stretch receptors are filling up faster, it's going to be in a fed state more often, we'll decrease our release of ghrelin. And then our glucose-dependent insulin, insulinotropic peptide, our GIP, this is what you'll see that's referred to as often. GIP's action, it's exocrine action and endocrine action. So it's two actions here. It's going to decrease gastric hydrogen secretion. So it's going to do the opposite of gastrin. It's going to try to decrease acidity in the gut. And it's going to increase insulin release from an endocrine standpoint. Any hormone or regulatory component that has an exocrine and endocrine action, I would put, the, put that in your brain as a need to know because they can ask you lots of questions on it, right? So this has both exocrine and endocrine function. It's how the gut, the small intestine, the stomach can be considered a uh, secondary endocrine organ, right? Because there are some hormones that can act on it, but it's not a primary endocrine organ. So it's not its only function. Fatty acids, amino acids, and oral glucose, and specifically oral glucose. Glucose being bound in your mouth increases. And other factors are there is a gastric inhibitory peptide 
that can affect this um, affect this actual gastro glucose dependent insulotrophic peptide. But I want to just before I get to your question, I want to just focus on the oral glucose piece. It's not affected by IV glucose. So it's not affected by glucose in the blood. It's specifically consuming glucose, glucose bound in the mouth that will trigger the release of this because the body's trying to absorb the glucose directly from the gut lumen. It's not actually talking about um, concentrations. This wouldn't be affected by hyper or hypoglycemia. It's specifically affected by oral glucose intake. I think that's probably one of the most confusing things that people get mixed up about. I had your hand first. Yeah, absolutely. So its main its main purpose, so exocrinely, it's going to decrease gastric gastric hydrogen ion secretion. And part of that is a protective factor of the gut to allow the gut to not be so acidic. So we have to have something besides bicarb that can do that. It's triggered by fatty acids, amino acids, and oral glucose to release insulin. That's typically its trigger there. The exocrine function is going to be when the stomach gets to be too acidic of a state. Yeah. So you I would they increased by, you can apply this here, insulin release. And when you're going to have more insulin, it's going to increase your insulin release when you're having more consumption of glucose and then things that can be used as fuel downstream. Does that kind of help? Great. Yes. So no, so this glucose dependent insulotrophic peptide is GIP. That's what we refer to as GIP. Not to be, or Yes, not to be confused with this GIP, which is why I put it here, gastric inhibitory peptide. Both are abbreviated as GIP sometimes in textbooks. The NPLEX will not abbreviate mostly anything. They will, unless if it's something that like T4, mm, no, they won't abbreviate anything. They'll give you the full words unless if it's on their approved abbreviations list. So that in that NPLEX study guide, there's the approved abbreviations list. If it's not on that list, they won't abbreviate it. But USMLE and a lot of your study books have GIP as this and GIP as this, which is why I have them both on here. Intrinsic factor. Woo, we know this one, or at least we've heard of this one, right? That's a memory recollection for this. So parietal cells produce intrinsic factor. If you don't have intrinsic factor, you lead downstream to decreased absorption of B12 or no absorption of B12, which can lead to pernicious anemia. So that's your pathology connection here. But from an action standpoint, vitamin, it's essentially known as a vitamin B12 binding protein, your intrinsic factor. It's going to be needed for B12 uptake in your terminal ileum. So again, B12, terminal ileum, so things that affect B12 absorption would be damage that terminal ileum or issues with intrinsic factor production. Increased by histamine or vagal input via acetylcholine, also, gastrin is going to increase it. So anytime we're getting food input to the body, the body's going to try to increase intrinsic factor to make sure if there's B12 present, we can capture that needed cofactor, right? Somatostatin, GIP, prostaglandin, secretin, all things that are going to kind of try to calm down some of those digestive processes of the gut can decrease intrinsic factor release. And if you do have that autoimmune destruction of parietal cells, you can get chronic gastritis and pernicious anemia as a secondary effect. So chronic gastritis, a cause could be anything that can cause autoimmune destruction to parietal cells. There are some autoimmune conditions that can do that specifically. And then pernicious anemia or anemia where you have B12 deficiency would be a megaloblastic anemia or um, uh, macrocytic anemia, right? Big cells with B12 loss versus microcytic iron deficiency anemia, small cells, normocytic anemia, most commonly associated with anemia of chronic disease. We'll get through maybe two more and then we'll, we'll let you give a brain break before we finish. Motilin. Our action of motilin, it's going to produce motor migrating or migrating motor complexes, helping with movement. It's increased by fasting state. And motilin receptor agonists, so erythromycin, used to stimulate intestinal peristalsis. So this is part of what helps our peristalsis move across. 
So we can see here, GI smooth muscle contraction is regulated by signaling inputs from all three of these following, acetylcholine, so our vagal stimulation, dopamine, our happy chemical, and motilin. All three can encourage GI smooth muscle contraction or peristaltic contraction or movement. Our parasympathetic rest and digest signals are gonna move down your cholinergic marrow neurons, so is motilin. You have acetylcholine release, acetylcholine release it hits that, um, neurotransmitter junction and is going to directly bind to our smooth muscle cells, which activates that smooth muscle contraction. So anything that can promote parasympathetic state, motilin release or dopamine can help with peristalsis. Anything that's going to decrease these states is going to decrease peristaltic contraction. So sympathetic state, obviously decreasing peristaltic contraction. Um, anything that's going to be a dopamine blocker, dopamine antagonist, decreasing our smooth muscle contraction. Then obviously things that are going to decrease motilin. So I would say of all of them, motilin is more stimulating peristaltic contractions, not necessarily stopping them. Versus our parasympathetic, sympathetic, that is going to be one way or the other. Dopamine or dopamine antagonist, one way or the other. So you can see people who have Alzheimer's disease, they have a decrease in maybe dopamine in the brain, dopamine availability. You'll see constipation, slowing of digestion and issues like that because they're having less peristalsis because they're having less dopamine input. Huh? Uh, no, Alzheimer's. You can see in Parkinson's too, the Alzheimer's, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Totally. So that's a great question. So fasting state, think of in the stomach. So if food is not in your stomach, your stomach is empty. That means that either you haven't ate or you've moved food into your small intestine. And so that's when peristalsis is important because when you're moving your food through, not necessarily that your small intestines or large intestines are clear. It means that you don't currently have food in your stomach. So you would consider that being a fasting state. Yeah. If you're completely fasting, like haven't ate for 24, 48 hours, you may do some peristalsis, but you're probably not going to do, you won't have really anything to move along. So it won't matter necessarily. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, think about stomach emptying. So gastric emptying could be another way to say this. So after gastric emptying, when you have small intestine or large intestine food present or bolus present, that's when peristalsis is really going to become more in effect because that's those peristaltic contractions are occurring in those smooth muscle cells. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so erythromycin, so it's a motilin. Um, I'm trying to pull up my little slide here for you to explain the mechanism. So the erythromycin is a motilin receptor agonist, and I'll tell you why. Here, where's my little picture? If I can't find it fast during our breaks, I'll pull up the picture for you, but I'm trying to look through my notebook. I have a little dude on here that should help. So this is just a little blurb, but I'll pull up the pathway when we go on our break so you can at least see the pathway, but it is a well-known antibiotic, but it's also at the motilin receptor agonist, it accelerates gastric emptying by stimulating cholinergic neurons and directly actually enhancing contractility of smooth muscle, which is why you can use it in SIBO. So at a small, small dose, you can use erythromycin as um, a motility agent after you do your typical like antibiotic phase, either herbally or with medicine. You can do like, I think it's 150 or 100 milligrams, a very small amount of erythromycin as a motility agent. And it'll actually help both to increase peristaltic contraction directly and via um, cholinergic neuron input. That was pretty cool. I, that's, that's the best short and sweet explanation I have, but I'll pull up a pathway for you that could maybe help kind of put two and two together. And I have actually used erythromycin in SIBO treatment because I had a patient who couldn't afford supplementation and it, it worked very well. I was pleasantly surprised. I had to do a little insurance magic, but I won't talk about that because I'm being recorded. Um, 
Dr. Petro? Yeah. I was going to say, is the medication or antibiotic you're thinking of the faxin? Sorry? Is the antibiotic you're talking about the faxin? Uh, no, erythromycin. Oh, okay. Erythromycin is known as an antibiotic, but you can use it as a motility agent as well. Different antibiotics treat the SIBO. This would be used as a motility agent after using antibiotics to treat the actual bacterial overgrowth. Thank you. Okay. We can talk SIBO treatment later. This is them. They won't ask you about SIBO treatment on NSLEX 1, I promise you. But that's a, that's a fun world. We can talk about SIBO treatment and the world of SIBO as a symptom and all kinds of good stuff. Okay. Um, nitric oxide. So, Am I cool to just, how many more slides do I have? Am I cool to just power through and get through this one and then we can break and maybe take a little bit like a full 10? Is that fine? Okay. Um, I think it helped the flow. So nitric oxide or action, again, increasing smooth muscle relaxation, including our a lower LES. So that's something to keep in mind. Nitric oxide can relax at lower esophageal sphincter, which can be good and not good, right? Hyal hernias, not so good. Gastric reflux, not so great leading to other things. But if we're having, if we're wanting to encourage passage of food through the esophagus, maybe we have like some achalasia or some issues with, um, with uh, almost like restriction, or we have some varices, relaxing that sphincter to allow passage of food might be helpful. The loss of nitric oxide secretion implicated, yeah, there we go, an increased tone of achalasia. So in achalasia, our issue of having the actual peristaltic contractions of our esophagus, if we lose nitric oxide secretion, we're not going to be able to have that relaxation and then that contraction. So it can actually potentially cause more sticking to that tissue overall. We could relax the LES, but then everything else is stuck up top. We don't have the, if we don't have NO at all, nitric oxide at all, then our sphincter is going to be tighter. And so then we have the combination of less peristaltic esophageal contractions and a less compliant sphincter. So you can just see manual um, opening of the esophagus over time or a feeding tube. Not so fun. All right, pepsin. Protein digestion, we've talked about this one a little bit more. Again, vagal stimulation. This is a huge theme. When in doubt, a lot of these things are stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system specifically through that vagal nerve, right? Cranial nerve 10, yes, yeah, 10, X. Uh, and, <laughs> brain. Uh, and, and also acetylcholine, because that's involved in parasympathetic nervous system. So that would be your neurotransmitter of choice. What's our neurotransmitter of choice for the sympathetic nervous system? Bonus question. Sympathetic nervous system, what's our neurotransmitter of choice for that one? Epinephrine, absolutely, versus acetylcholine for parasympathetic. Good. And then also local acid, right? If we have local acid in the small intestine, that means that we just move contents from the stomach in there through the pyloric sphincter. That's going to trigger pepsin release because we're like, oh, we have, we now have proteins, we now have stuff we need to digest. Pepsinogen, the inactive form, is converted to pepsin in the presence of hydrogen. So we get that acid, pepsinogen, then the zymogen then becomes pepsin, the active form, then we can break down protein. We have three more. Secretin. Its main action is it's going to actually increase pancreatic bicarb secretion and bile secretion. So it's going to help the pancreas neutralize the acid and it's going to increase our bile coming from the gallbladder. So it's going to add some acid and reduce some acid. It's also going to decrease gastric acid secretion because it's going to be increasing bicarb, right? That makes sense. It's increased by acidity, fatty acids in the lumen of the duodenum because that means we just released some acid from the stomach. And then also we're wanting to trigger that bile release. And then somatostatin, two more. Somatostatin, its action is going to decrease gastric acid and pepsinogen secretion. It's going to promote pancreatic and small intestine. It's going to decrease pancreatic and small intestine fluid secretion. 
It's going to decrease gallbladder contraction. I believe these are all decreases. And it's going to decrease insulin and glucagon release. I think these are all decreases. Let me just double check myself though really fast. So I don't want to send you down the wrong way. That would be really unfortunate today. Yes, okay, great. It is decreased for all. I thought I made it in one nice little sentence for us, but sometimes I get excited. Okay, it's increased by acidity and it's going to decrease by vagal stimulation. So this is almost opposite. So instead of being increased by vagus, the vagus nerve, it's gonna be decreased by the vagus nerve. Why? Yeah, exactly. So somatostatin, you can think about as your stopper of digestion. So if you have vagus nerve input, you don't want to stop digestion. You want to promote it. If you have sympathetic input, you might actually, you could potentially decide to release some somatostatin to kind of stop or halt this process. Sympathetic stimulation doesn't directly promote this process, but if sympathetic stimulation stops vagal stimulation, then this could potentially be released. And I say other factors inhibit secretion of a variety of hormones because it's stopping all these processes. So when in doubt, if you're trying to find something that's going to inhibit another key regulator of the, the GI, somatostatin wouldn't be a bad guess if you're not 100% sure. So it's stopping a lot of these processes from happening. And our last one is vasoactive intestinal polypeptide or VIP. It's the VIP of our gastro group. Its action is going to increase intestinal water. It's going to increase their electrolyte secretion into the intestine, right? Water and sodium tend to travel together. They can. It's going to relax intestinal smooth muscle and going to relax sphincters. So if you thought about this as um, a pathological thing, it would be increasing watery diarrhea, right? You're increasing water input into the lumen. You're, you're losing some electrolytes with that. You're going to relax your smooth muscles so things can flow through fast. And your sphincters are open. So everything's just flowing through. So in that sense, you could be increasing gastric motility by VIP. Absolutely. Your body, vasointestinal polypeptide, when you get food poisoning or when you have some assaults to your gut and your body needs to move things through fast, VIP is one of the things that increases. There is a, so it's, it's increased by distension and vagal stimulation. It's decreased by adrenergic input. So there is a nervous system component. So there can be an emotional component to VIP release. They have measured it in people with IBS and some of them they've seen an uptick and some of them they haven't. So they haven't seen it enough to say it's a um, measurable like diagnostic factor. Um, logically though, if it's happening on a physiologic level, I would assume it's happening at least sometimes with those patients, but maybe not all the time. So you don't have a direct like emotional link. Yeah. You can see it with VIP OMA, so vaso inactive intestinal peptide OMA, so an actual cell tumor, a non beta islet cell pancreatic tumor that secretes VIP. So, in that tumor, then you're going to see increased loose stools, decreased absorption, lower electrolyte states. You can have lower blood volume. You have orthostatic hypotension because you're of lower electrolytes overall. And the symptoms that you can have occurring, it's called WDHA syndrome, which watery diarrhea, hypokalemia, and achlorhydria. Low stomach acid, low potassium, lots of watery diarrhea, which is pretty much what we already said. But you just knowing what this does, then if there's a tumor that secretes it, it's going to cause all those things to happen. You don't even need to memorize WDHA syndrome. You can. You don't have to. There's too much to memorize. That's why I say don't. Don't memorize it, be able to walk yourself through it. But maybe memorize the locations that these occur. That would be something to memorize. All right, we're gonna take like a, a good solid 10 minute break at least. So until 10, 10, if you get back a little later, that's okay too. I'm gonna set up our next section, which is gonna be kidney, wherever my camera is. Oh, kidney um, is what we're gonna get into next.
And then um, what we'll do is we'll get through the kidney stuff because I want to make sure we get through what I want to lecture on. And then I have a whole host of kind of activities that we can work through, some anatomy, some cases, um, and that's what we'll finish up the day on, some games. So then if you're like, I'm not into participation today, you can take off after kidney. But if you're feeling like I want to do some, some socialization, then you can do that towards the end. Sound good? All right, we'll be back at 10.10 or 10.11.